As we begin our series on the kingdom of God, I'm going to do something this morning that I've never done before. You're all racking your brain to try to figure out what that might be. I've been preaching for a long, long time, and uh, out of all of those sermons, all of those Sundays, all of those years of preaching, I have never before preached a sermon that's based on a scripture from 1 Chronicles. Nor have I done the 2 Chronicles either, just coincidentally. Uh, so today, as I take 1 Chronicles chapter 17, you all, you are witnessing history right here. The first sermon ever preached by Andy Bryan from either one of the Chronicles, for that matter. This is chapter 17 of 1 Chronicles. It's back in the beginning part of your Bible, in case you... Because I had to look it up, too. I, it's, I'm so unfamiliar. I thought it was a letter of Paul. Letter of Paul to the Chronicles. I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? It sounds, it sounds legit. So this is 1 Chronicles, uh, a history of the nation of Israel... Uh, one little story from this history in verse seven, chapter 17. Now, when David settled in his house, David said to the prophet Nathan, I'm living in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under a tent. Nathan said to David, do all that you have in mind, for God is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, You shall not build me a house to live in. For I have not lived in a house since the day I brought out Israel to this very day, but I've lived in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies before you, and I will make for you a name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall wear them down no more as they did formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will subdue all your enemies. Moreover, I declare to you that the Lord will build you a house. When your days are fulfilled to go to be with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. I will not take my steadfast love from him as I took it from him who was before you, but I will confirm him in my house and in my kingdom forever. And his throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. And this is a word of God for the people of God. We say the words at least once a week every time we speak the Lord's Prayer. We say the three words, thy kingdom come. But have we ever stopped to think about what exactly we're asking for? Have we ever taken just a moment to say, what is this kingdom that we're asking to be delivered here? And when will it arrive? I mean, can we click on next day shipping or are we going to three to five days traditional shipping plan? I understand now that Amazon even has a previous day shipping feature. That's right. They will deliver your product the day before you order it. When is this kingdom going to be delivered? What is it? Where is it going to show up? This next four weeks, we'll spend some time thinking about these questions. But before we get to those, I'd like to take a moment to think about the who of the kingdom. 
Who is it that's making the delivery? Who is it that's doing the work? Who is it that's building the treehouse? Who is doing the kingdom work? Now, of course, the easy answer, the first thing that pops to mind, the thing that we always say when we're in church and we're asked a question, God. Well, that's the easy answer, isn't it? God's the one doing the work. Yes. In fact, we learned that early on in Sunday school. If you're ever stumped as to what your teacher's talking about, you just raise your hand and say Jesus. Nine times out of ten, you'll be right. But sometimes, in fact, I would submit most of the time, the easy answer is not the sufficient answer. And I think that the answer to this question, who's doing the kingdom work, If we just simply answer God and leave it there, it's not only insufficient, it's also perhaps a bit dangerous. And I'd like to explain why I feel that way. So we turn to this scripture story, this little glimpse into the history of the nation, a glimpse of the life of King David. King David has accomplished a great thing. He has united the tribes of Israel in one nation. They follow him as their king. He has brought the the people together in a powerful way and has established himself as the king. He's built this wonderful palace in which he resides. And he sits here in his palace. We know it's a fancy palace because it's made out of cedar, a very expensive building material. He's built this wonderful thing. He's sitting here in this luxurious accommodation. And he's thinking to himself, well, here I am in this beautiful palace. And there the Ark of the Covenant is, and it's out there in a tent. Why should God's Ark be housed in a tent when I myself am housed in a palace? I know what I'll do. I'll build a palace for the Ark as well. I'll build a house in which the presence of God can dwell. He bounces that idea off of his right-hand man, Nathan, his prophet. And Nathan says, sounds good to me, go for it. But that night, God visits Nathan. And God says, not so fast, my friend. I've got something I'd like for you to tell David. Start with, no, you will not be building me a palace. You will not be building me a house, David. That's not what you're supposed to be doing. Remember where you came from, David. You're the shepherd. You're the warrior. I need you to lead the people like a shepherd. I need you to deal with the threats to the nation like a warrior. You're not the builder here. Oh, and by the way, if there's any building that's going to be happening, I will be doing the building, thus saith the Lord. It is my house. It is my kingdom. I'm the one doing the building. Go and tell that to David, brother Nathan. And he does. So at first blush, it looks like this scripture actually reinforces that easy answer. Who's doing kingdom work? Well, God is. It says so right here in this scripture. David was prevented from doing the building of this palace, of this temple, of this house for the ark. Because God said that God was going to be the one doing the work. So at first, it seems like that actually reinforces our easy answer. The only problem with that is that up to this episode, David has been working pretty hard. David has been doing a whole lot of work for God's sake. David has been defeating enemies. David has been uniting people together. David has been building a nation. And, as it turns out, immediately after this episode, David gets right back to work. There's still stuff that needs to be done. Systems of justice need to be put in place. Military commanders need to be appointed. He appoints gatekeepers. He appoints priests. He appoints musicians to play for the worship services. He's a bit of a micromanager, this David. But he appoints all these folks, and then he organizes this nation. He continues to do the work, work for God's sake. So how do we answer that question? Was it God working? Was it David working? Who's doing this kingdom work? 
Maybe it becomes clearer for us when we think about what kind of work was being done. David was doing shepherd work. David was doing warrior work. David was doing, in other words, the work that God needed him to be doing at this time, at this place. You're not a builder, God said to David. You don't build stuff. I have someone else in mind for that. That will happen, but it's not time for that to happen right now. I need you to do the specific task to which I have called you. See, it's not quite so simple as saying God was working or David was working. The answer is trickier than that. It's, it's more subtle than that. That easy answer is rarely sufficient. How do we figure out what it means to work for the kingdom. When it comes to the kingdom of God, one way that the answer is dangerous is that we become complacent when we say God's at work. We become lethargic when we say God's at work. Kingdom work belongs to God. That means I don't have to do anything because God's the one doing the work. Who's doing kingdom work? God is. That means I can just play Xbox all day because God's the one working, right? You all know the story, the joke that goes, uh, a man, his home was uh, in, the, in the path of floodwaters. And so a jeep goes by and, and they say, come with us, your house is going to get flooded. And he says, no, no, God will work here. I trust God. God will be at work here to protect me. Okay, and they drive away. As the floodwaters rise and he goes to the porch, a canoe paddles by. Dude, you got to come with us. The floodwaters are rising. They're going to continue to rise. No, no, God will work here. I trust God. God is going to work here to save me. Okay, and they paddle off. He's up on the roof of his building. The floodwaters still rise. A helicopter flies by. Dude, you got to come with us. This water's not going to go away. You are going to die. No, no, I trust God. God's going to work here in this situation. And the helicopter flies away. Dude gets swept off the roof and dies. Well, you knew that was going to happen because it's a joke. But he gets swept off the, rope, the roof and dies, and he goes to heaven, and he's like... God, what? I, you were going to work. Why did you not? And God says, look, you moron, I sent you a jeep and a canoe and a helicopter, and you didn't take any of those options, so it's kind of your issue here, right? <laughs> so, so God is, yes, at work in this world, but our work cooperates with what God is doing. We are doing God's work. Someone told me another joke after second service, after they heard the sermon, they told me about the old farmer who, who bought this nasty field, a field that was overgrown and weedy and just had rocks and boulders. It was just horrible, horrible, nasty, ugly, weedy, ugly field. And he cultivated and he worked the land and he planted crops and he planted trees and he you know, just made it look so beautiful. A friend of his came to him and said, boy, it was great work that you and the Lord did on that field. He said, he said, yeah, but you should have seen what it looked like when it was just God working on it, man. It was, it was nasty. <clears throat> so one of the dangers of answering this question with the easy answer is that we become complacent, that we become lethargic, that we forget we have a role to play in this work. But the second danger is a little bit sneakier. The second danger is a little more insidious. Who's at work in the world? Well, God's at work in the world. Answering it that way allows us to advance our own agenda and pretend that it's God's or disguise it with God's. An agenda that advances our own power, an agenda that advances our own comfort or our own personal prosperity. We can work for ourselves and then claim that God is at work in the world. Do you doubt that this happens? Our history, church, is filled with examples from which we could draw. I mean, think about the Crusades. Think about what the Crusades were. Think about the results of of. of, of 
the disease and the death and the, the pillage of treasures and the destruction of cultures. They sent children on these crusades to, to conquer these lands and said, it's the will of God. As a matter of fact, if you don't believe me, sending your child along on this crusade can buy your way out of hell. It's God's will. It's for the kingdom of God. Think about the Inquisition. Let's have an interview. Let's figure out what you believe. And if what you believe isn't what I believe, then you will be killed. It's the will of God. It's for the sake of the kingdom. The church did this. Think about the colonization of our own continent. Cultures that were destroyed. Lives that were lost. People who were killed in the name of Christ. Here's a clue. If you have to mix gold, glory, and God all together, you're doing it wrong. It's for God or not at all. Modern day experience has examples. How many military funerals have been picketed in the name of God? We're doing kingdom work here. We're doing the work of the kingdom. It's not me. It's for God's sake. People preach prosperity gospel that says you can make as much money as you want. You can be as comfortable as you want. It's actually evidence of God's blessing in your life. Never mind how much your neighbor might be suffering. We are expert at advancing our own agenda and then saying it's, it's God. It's God's work. It's the work of the kingdom. A huge danger of this easy answer is it allows us to do just that. And advancing your own agenda while claiming that it's God's agenda is the height of hypocrisy. Jesus confronted it over and over again throughout the gospel as the Pharisees advanced their own agenda and claimed it was, in fact, the will of God. Augustine wrote, The earthly city glories in itself. The heavenly city glories in the Lord. Is our action, are our actions glorifying God or just glorifying ourselves? Think about it. David could have continued and built that palace for the ark anyway. I mean, couldn't he? It would have been really easy for him to do that. I want to build a grand and glorious temple in which to house the ark. And Nathan would come back to say, God doesn't want that right now. David could very easily have then proceeded with that plan, claiming that it was God's will, claiming that it was for the sake of the kingdom. I have an idea, King David would say. Let's build this beautiful, opulent palace for the ark. It's what it deserves, after all. It's for God's sake, after all. And everyone would have loved that idea. I mean, who are you to argue with the king? Great idea, Dave. Let's do it. The only problem was building that opulent palace would not have glorified God. It would have glorified David. And for that reason, God did not want that to be done. If there's a unifying, undergirding principle of kingdom work, it is work that does not glorify the self, but rather glorifies God. So what do we do with all this? How do we answer this question with a non-safe answer. Well, why are we so afraid to claim that it's us doing the work? Why are we so afraid to say, I'm doing the kingdom work. You're doing the kingdom work. We, as the church of Jesus Christ in this world, we're the ones doing the work. There's nothing wrong with saying it. There's nothing wrong with claiming it. We work hard at doing what God desires. And in fact, we should be celebrating each and every moment. We should be celebrating children leading worship. We should be celebrating youth standing here and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. We should be celebrating people going to Nicaragua to see how God's grace is being offered in a 
transforming ways in communities through Rainbow Network. We should be celebrating how people of this congregation are out in our community helping where help is needed. We should be celebrating how people give with such generosity that equips and empowers such transforming ministry. I could go on and on and on about the ways that we as the church of Jesus Christ are doing the kingdom work. And so let's claim it. Let's celebrate it. Who is doing the work of the kingdom? I am. You are. We are. The church together. And so, we'd better make sure that the work we're doing truly is God's work. We'd better make sure that the work that we do as the church truly is God's work. We're doing the work, but we can never forget that it's God's work that we're doing. So how do we sort that out? How do we figure out if what we're doing is actually God's kingdom work? Well, at this point, I would mention that there are three weeks left in this worship series. So we have some time to ask that question, to think about those kinds of thoughts. In the meantime, I'd like for each one of you to take some time during this week to think about what you do, to think about the things that you do, to think about the words that you say, to think about the thoughts that you think. Whose agenda do they promote? Do the actions that you take glorify God and God alone? Or do your actions glorify you? Do the words that you speak bring God's kingdom to life in this situation? Are the words that you add to any conversation God-inspired words? Or are they your words? Are they words that come from wanting to maintain status quo, maintain your comfort, maintain whatever it is that makes you feel good about yourself? You see, we have this this gift of a beautiful, discerning mind. I'm asking all of us to take some time this week to use that gift in honest discernment of our lives. It's really a bold thing to do, to to pray, thy kingdom come. Those are powerful, powerful words. Are we working to make that prayer real? Augustine also said, pray as though everything depended on God. Work as though everything. Everything depended on you. Would you pray with me, please? Holy God, we want to be doing your work. We want to be doing kingdom work together as your church. So help us. Help us to discern how, how we might act on your behalf, how we might might speak words that glorify you and you alone, how we might even think thoughts that are worthy of you and your kingdom, only by the guidance power, presence of your abiding Holy Spirit. And so we place ourselves fully in your hands and pray this prayer to you in the name of Jesus, by the power of your Spirit. Amen.